Major funding for Discovery Road brought to you in part by the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area, with additional funding from the Mormon Pioneer National Heritage Area and the National Park Service. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Discovery Road. I'm James Nelson. In this episode, we pay a visit to a place where many different people converged, cross paths, all in search of a better way of life, and where one group in particular arrived, built up, celebrated, and then faded like a beautiful sunset. It's the enchanting story of the Japanese in the San Luis Valley of Colorado. The beautiful San Luis Valley of Colorado was a big attraction for many different people. Native Americans, early European explorers, Hispanics, Mormons, and the often forgotten Japanese. Each group contributing with farms, ranches, working the land, mining the hills, and building communities. In Alamosa, Colorado, at the San Luis Valley Museum, just beyond the American flag fluttering there, a fitting mural of a tree recognizing the different cultures who were all part of the valley portrait. The first Japanese uh, came to the valley uh, in the early 1900s uh, to work on the railroads. Uh, then by the 1920s, people had settled here and they were sending back for relatives and family and friends in uh, Riverside, California. And uh, during the 20s, they started moving to the valley and built these uh, truck farms, a lot of them, with uh, lettuce, broccoli, cauliflower, peas, uh, all cool season crops uh, based on our climate here. We happened upon this old time train engine being restored, repaired, and prepared for a trip to Texas. It was the perfect reminder that the Japanese families came to the San Luis Valley for many reasons, including the railroad. Alabosa in the San Luis Valley has a rich railroad history, um, hauling agricultural products, um, mining products, timber products. So the railroads of the San Luis Valley here go back to the 1880s, and they brought in immigrants from around the country as well as around the world, and provided a lot of jobs for the people that were locally here. Um, pretty much covering all the different cultures and religions in the area. It was served by the Denver Rio Grande, and then you also had the San Luis Central and San Luis Valley Southern that ran off the Denver River Grande here in the valley. You, at one time, could take a train from here to Pueblo, here to Durango, here to Salida. Hi there. You want some water? These two sisters are holding on to a piece of important history. You see, Joseph Masahito Sato was one of the first Japanese to settle in the San Luis Valley. He introduced new crops and unpacked a new culture. They were pretty good crops because I know they had a, a shed here that they take all that to Fort Garland to put in the train. They shipped it from Fort Garland on the trains. And also there was a train up to Haroso and they would he would take it to San Acasio because there was another train there. He farmed the land and a lot of people worked for him and that's how they survived. From what I understand, my grandfather was a ger generous person, so he helped people. Sato's journey to America was eventful. At age 19, he was a fireman on a ship that sailed worldwide. Eventually, though, on the eastern seaboard of the U.S., the job was gone. So for him, it was a long train ride to faraway New Mexico. At a hotel in Chama, he found work as a cook and of course, met the dishwasher, Amelia Montano. And somewhere between cooking hot meals, pots, pans, plates, cups, forks, and saucers, 
they fell in love, but their courtship was certainly not smooth. They told him to become a Catholic, he did. They told him to, that he had to pay so much money. I don't know how much money, but it must have been quite a bit for that time. And then he had to have a job. He had to have a place for them to live. Uh, just basic things, I guess. A mixed marriage, cultural differences, and some rough times doled out by the dominant culture as public trouncing of the unaccepted. They would call them Japs and they would call them, you know, if something didn't go right, you know, it was, that was the time, I guess, you know. My mother told me about times when they would get beat up. I really don't know the reasoning, but it was all because they were Japanese, basically. The marriage lasted, the crops took hold, and Joseph Sato employed many with his farming knowledge that he learned from his father long ago in Japan. In an unusual twist, Sandra learned about her Japanese ancestry when she joined the military and was stationed in Japan. What it taught me while I was in Japan is I learned the Japanese culture, I learned their traditions, and I learned how to cook some of their foods, and I think I learned to have some humility because they, they, you know, they did go through a lot. They went through World War II, they had the Chinese there, they had, you know, they had a hard life. So when I got there, all that was, it was behind them, but it was still there. So I felt that. Little of the Japanese family history survived. The working farm is long gone. But despite years of struggle, the land remains in the family. They would put this in the ground and they would, it was just so deep. And that's what the little ditches that it did, it made, is where they would put the seeds. And that's how they kept them in a row. They struggled during the 50s to pay for this farm because it was in the bank on a loan. And so they, I know my parents worked hard to get it. Uh, and that's how my dad created the junkyard because that's what he did and they bought it back. I know that when I was young t today, I look back and I think we were poor in many things, but we were rich in family and food. We never had to worry about food. And we never had to worry about family. And so that's, that is part of my heritage. I believe that the story needs to be told because it's something that our community should be proud of. There's a lot of cultures in the community, so th the Japanese is not the only uh, culture, but there are other cultures that need to be uh, told because it blends in the community. That's what we are today. In this old black and white photograph, an important piece of the Japanese story is forever frozen in time. You can see it, all smartly dressed, polished and posing for a celebration. Underneath bonnets and fancy hats and neckties, determination on their faces, moms and dads, boys and girls, friends and families, a community brimming with anticipation while peering out into the San Luis Valley in search of an unknown future. Here in the beautiful San Luis Valley of Colorado, the potato is a wonderful story. Not just about spud varieties grown in deep, rich soil, filled with sun-soaked nutrients and farmed with the best hands. The tractor equipment out there, digging it up, and putting it in, and then the harvest picks up, loads it in these trucks. Got it. They bring the trucks over here and back up here, and then we run over, over all this table here. But it's a story about a people, including the Japanese, who tilled the soil, planted seeds, cultivated the crops, and contributed mightily 
to the potato paradise now revered around the world. It's a way of life. It's, it's something that I was born into, I love. And you know, the, the thing about it, it's a challenge every day. I've never been bored in my life. I've been stressed, but bored, never bored. And there's always, every year is a new year. I get, to, I get to try something. I get to, I get to start over. You know, I mean, how many people can do that? How many people can go, you know, hey, I got a brand new year, I get, I get to try it again. Alfalfa, barley, and wheat are also grown on the farm, providing lots of jobs. It all started with his parents more than 75 years ago, when locals helped them plow into the soil 160 acres of cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, and lettuce. Back when I was, I was a child, I mean, there was a lot of Japanese people here, and almost all of them were, were in farming. And I guess there was the opportunity was here, and uh, as my parents and them all age, you know, they either uh, children didn't want to continue in the farming operation, or, other, or else uh, the business itself is really hard. And attrition just took its place over the years. Just, you know, and uh, we've, it ended up with just, there's just a few Japanese farmers left in this area. Watching the potato harvest can be mesmerizing. From the modern day mechanics of tractors and the scooping of potatoes out of the earth, separating the rocks, sophisticated computers, filling truckload after truckload, and then more sorting as the spuds take another ride. This one into a warehouse where centennial russets are piled high and stored until they are sacked and headed for stores and restaurants around the country. It's all fresh, it goes all over, all over, but it's all fresh, fresh potatoes go like uh, Costco and uh, Walmart. Probably the main buyers. So right now we just got a uh, we just got our truck loaded. Rosario unhooked me from the tow bar. I'm going to back up really slowly here. Um, I get about midway past the harvester. It's actually pretty enjoyable. I like it. It's uh, the only other farming experience I've had is doing um, tobacco farming in Tennessee, and it's a lot messier. <laughs> so potato farming is a lot cleaner and a lot more uh, efficient, I would say. And then these guys are great to work with. They're, they know what they're doing, and they're pretty pretty patient with you too, so it's not bad at all. This rocket was loose, and then I think the chain just ended up getting a little too loose. Of course, they're always concerned about the weather on a farm operation, but there's another concern. When equipment breaks down, when it happens, it's not a good thing. Uh, we got some Allen wrenches. We had a few breakdowns yesterday, and then we were cleaning out the harvester because it gets filled up with dirt, and when it gets filled up with dirt, it gets too much weight on it. Um, and so, as we were doing that, some, one of the systems messed up, and the whole thing raised up, and then just the computer wouldn't let it go back down, basically. So, um, we tried to go till seven, but we could only go till four o'clock. You know, we said, we shouldn't work Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I go, who won? <laughs> we'll just go on through the steps and processes of elimination, trying to get things diagnosed and figure out what's what is the issue, what's not turning on and everything. Hello. It gets frustrating when you can't do the whole day because you only get this much done when we usually can get twice as much done in one day. So, but that's just part of it. Let me try to reverse it, Byron. What's it looking like, Chris? I'm going to tighten the fan belt and uh, go from there. We'll start adjusting a few settings here and there, trying to get more of the clots taken out. Eventually, the problem was fixed, and the harvest rolled on. Ironically, Kanugi often finds himself speaking Spanish with many of his workers. <laughs> But his own native tongue never survived in the big San Luis Valley. My family really didn't want us and didn't teach us to speak, speak Japanese because they wanted us to probably assimilate into the culture more. So we, we, just, we were just taught to speak English all the time. 
Not far from the Canoogie Farm, inside the Sierra Grande School, we found evidence of how many Japanese once lived around here. It was down a hallway, numerous photos, each one representing a family story. But one by one, they have moved away, found work elsewhere, and just like the Japanese language, nearly all disappeared. I wish I'd have had the chance to learn it and be fluent in it, so, but uh, it's just how it is. I wish, I wish to, there was uh, an older generation to teach us, and we're losing so much of that culture now. And I mean, I miss, I miss, I miss my parents, I miss, I miss people like Bessie and all them, because there's so much knowledge and so much history, so much food and all this stuff that we are gonna lose. How long are you gonna do this? Probably till I die. If I didn't have kids in, interested in that, I would quit and you know, and do something else maybe. But for right now, as long as I have kids there, I want them to have the chance to be involved in it. I'm, I'm proud of my family. I'm proud of what we've done and a lot of other farms that have done well. Anybody in agriculture needs to be proud. Cause I mean, we're, we're doing this for a nation. To, you know, to produce and all that, and I think it's a great, it's, what a, what a great job to have. On the campus of Adams State University, there's a beautiful Japanese-American memorial garden, honoring the first generation of Japanese settlers in the big San Luis Valley outdoor art pieces depicting cranes, long-standing symbols of Japanese culture, perched above running water, reminders of the pioneer gifts from the Japanese. So I paint the cranes a lot, and the Japanese people believe this, uh, the crane is for good fortune and happiness. And so they believe that a crane can live a thousand years. I, I just always was inspired by that and liked to paint them. During our visit, the Japanese presence was much less from decades past. Today, the language is not readily heard. Traditional food, mostly unavailable. Even the Buddhist temple is now out of business. All of that diminishing culture sent us to one woman in particular, Bessie Konishi. That's why I've kept so many things in my home. And not only for that reason, but because I love it. I love the Japanese culture. I'm proud to be a Japanese. I love their ways. I love the way they keep their traditions alive. Her given name was Miyako Yoshida, one of 12 children of Frank and Iseo Yoshida. It was commonplace for names to be changed back then to fit into the neighborhood, so she became Bessie. The family farm became prolific, producing cabbage, cauliflower, and her father became known as the Lettuce King of the San Luis Valley. In the field, they will not be reopened until they arrive at retail outlets as far away as the eastern seaboard. They had to be sharecroppers because they couldn't own land. They had a picture of my father, my uncle, and a good friend farming together south of Alamosa here. They told how they had grossed $10,000, and this was back in, oh my gosh, like 1930 or so. It was before I was born. And it, it made the Denver Pipers with their potatoes that year. $10,000 back then would probably be what? Close to a million here, you know, nowadays, yeah. I would say like in the 40s, there were quite a few Japanese families here. 
And as I said later, a lot of them did come from other parts of Colorado too. Most of them are farmers, the majority of them are farmers. In 1937, there were enough Japanese in the San Luis Valley to build their own Buddhist temple. And right there, at the dedication, five-year-old Bessie. It quickly became the hub for the Japanese. It served as a language school and entertainment center. Oh, we used to have um, Buddhist celebrations there too. We would celebrate Buddha's birthday in April. And so we would learn Japanese dances and we'd dress in kimono. Everybody would bring Japanese food and we'd have a big celebration. Anniversaries were celebrated there, weddings were celebrated there. Early on, the church struggled, but they survived through innovation. Uh, in the Buddhist church, when they first started, they didn't have enough money you know, to buy song books for everybody. And so they wrote the Japanese songs on sheets of white sheets of cloths in Japanese. And they were tacked on a frame in the front of the church. And as the songs were sung, then someone would flip the next page, just like you would in a book, only it was written on sheets. Over time, the families moved out and moved on. Gradually, the church became less vital. It was too expensive to keep open, and it was sold. As war sent fear across the land, places like the Lahara Church were desecrated. And this photograph shows not only a community in mourning and the loss of one of their own because he fled California during the roundup, but a lasting image of dignity that would soon diminish. My mother's side, we had cousins in Norwalk, California, and so they came. And they were not farmers, they lived in the city. And so they were trying to farm, and back then they were still using horses. This was in the 40s. And so he wasn't used to that, and the horses ran away, and the wagon ran over him and killed him. And they got permission to hold his funeral in the boarded up Buddhist church in Lahara. And afterwards, they took a picture with his casket in the front and everybody who was there at the funeral so they could send it back home to Japan to his relatives. It's a very, very sad picture. The picture that Bessie remembers from more than 70 years ago is steeled in her mind's eye about a trip to the store to buy groceries. I was, what, 10 years old when the war broke out? And so, oh, there was a lot of prejudice at school, of course. We were called Japs all the time. A lot of the stores in town here in Alamosa did not want us in their stores. Did not want us to come in their stores. There was one small grocery store on the south side of town where all the Hispanics lived, the south side of Alamosa, a Lebanese couple, and they told us we were welcome to come into their store. And this still makes me cry to this day. They said that it was not our fault we were at war with Japan, and we were welcome to come into their store. A new beginning when she married Ben Konishi. He would become a revered veterinarian in the San Luis Valley for 66 years. But the early days were anything but easy. Bessie's ironing board served as his first operating table. And there were those who avoided his practice because of his race. The ugliness continued involving their children, prejudice and harassment prompting Bessie to start a kindness program throughout the Valley school system. She wanted to make a difference because she understood what it meant to be um, a not only a woman, but a Japanese woman growing up in an era of fear during World War II. And in the San Luis Valley, she has taken upon herself to educate people about uh, about being tolerant. She, she, uh, she gives programs on the, um, the culture of the Japanese and 
what the um, influences were in the San Luis Valley with the Japanese community. These two panels are just two of four that were made when the Lahara Church was um, built, and they were written by two different Buddhist priests. The one on this side says, Daijo Aki Kotonakude. That means Jodo Shinshu sect, never give up your belief. And on this side, it says, Isumo Myoterasunari, always believe in you. If you believe in that, it will always believe in you. And it was written by Tamai Yoshitake. Yoshitake Tamai. Trips to Japan with her grandchildren and a promise that each will get a chance to select a Japanese artifact from her museum-like home. Ongoing mentoring from the unofficial family historian. She taught us a very important Japanese word, gaman which means patience, enduring the unbearable with dignity. Father A.T. Yoshida passed away in 1964, and my mother, Isayo Yoshida, passed away in 1992. And you can see the Buddha symbol on both of them too. Bessie's lifelong journey to tell the Japanese story is an artful walk of perseverance and a lasting lesson for all of us. People aren't going to remember, no, because there weren't very many of us. And we weren't loud, we weren't, you know, we were quiet. Yeah, no, they're not going to remember. That's why I feel it's so important for me to get it down, you know? Get it written down, talk about it. We shouldn't be forgotten. We're, we were a part of the history here in the San Luis Valley, an important part. The signature of the Japanese can be found all across the San Luis Valley. Their story of work, sacrifice, and struggle should never be lost. And the beauty and spirit of their contributions ought to be admired as a proud story of elegance like a crane in search of a smooth flight through life. I'm James Nelson. We'll see you next time out here on Discovery Road. Mm -hmm.